So welcome everybody um, to this uh, plenary session today, Monday the 23rd of April, and um, this is on immunotherapy. And I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people here uh, this morning, and I'm sure you'll be um, en enhanced, entertained um, by what will be a, a wonderful array of speakers. So on behalf of myself and Professor Vijay Kumar, who are the uh, chairs of this particular session, uh, I'm delighted to um, commence the session now. Uh, the first speaker in this session is uh, Professor Peter Doherty, Nobel Laureate, who is uh, now um, a Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. Um, he has a stellar track record in the discovery of the fundamental basis of, of immunology and, it, and leading to immunotherapy as it currently exists today. Uh, and you'll be hearing also by the other speakers in this session about how that's transforming uh, the way in which we look at cancer uh, and we're able to treat patients that previously had very poor um, outcomes. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Peter Doherty. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I can't see you. I'm blinded by lights, but uh, good morning. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about um, killer T cells, largely, but I'm, as I'm the first speaker, and I guess not all of you are immunologists, so people in cancer have become so familiar with immunology, I'll do a bit of um, kind of explainer as well. And as we all know, um, of late, if we're talking about novel drug development, the immunotherapy era, er, area is dominating a lot of our discussion of cancer and cancer therapy. And this is, of course, a rather new development. As an immunologist, I actually started as a pathologist, but as an immunologist, um, if someone had asked, well, what has immunology done for medicine um, 20 years ago, we would have said vaccines. And that was a bit fake anyway, because there's only one vaccine that I know of that was ever developed by a professional immunologist, and that's Ian Fraser's human papillomavirus vaccine. And uh, the others were all developed by infectious disease types. My own area is infectious disease. I um, started in veterinary medicine and uh, was, did about 10 years working on infectious disease of domestic animals and then uh, switched into the basic science space. I switched from working on sheep uh, to working on mice, which converted me from being a DVM to an MD, a mouse doctor. Look, what's happened here? I've gone backwards. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. There's a red arrow that goes backwards and a big green one, which of course I can't see. I, I can never actually see anything that's big. I always pick the non-obvious, I'm afraid. So my area of interest really over the decades has been the infection pathogen challenge. And as we all know, we're constantly challenged by new infections that come out of nature. Our particular focus over the last 20 or plus years has been in uh, influenza research. And these, in the influenza A viruses, uh, the pandemic viruses which come at us out of re reassortment or re uh, between animal viruses and human viruses, or as it was the case with the recent swine influenza, reassortment between a couple of pig viruses, though one of those pig viruses at least was substantially of human origin. We think it had gone from humans into pigs. These things go both ways. These are our, probably our main pandemic threats. But we're constantly having to deal uh, with new pathogens coming from nature. And you'll be familiar with the story of the bat-borne viruses like Hendra virus, Lissa virus, Ebola virus, Marburg virus, and so forth, uh, Nipah virus that we've been dealing with of late. Uh, some of them don't have particular pandemic potential, others do. Uh, immunity itself, we think, uh, uh, I think particularly because I work on infectious disease, has evolved essentially to deal with infection. Uh, we are large, complex, multi-organ, uh, multicellular systems. We're very slowly reproducing. Uh, we change very slowly in the sense of mutation and adaption. And so we have to have something that will protect us against a myriad of unpredictable pathogens that multiply very, very quickly, differentiate very quickly, can mutate very quickly, as is the case with influenza viruses and with HIV. And uh, uh, 
can run around us, if you like, if we don't have some sort of sophisticated type of immune response. The word Im immunology or immun immunity itself comes from immunus, which means without tax. And what it's about to uh, infectious disease people, at least, is uh, remo removing the tax of infection. Uh, also, McFarlane Burnett, many decades ago, suggested immunity was also there to protect us against the transmission of cancer. Uh, not virus-induced cancers, but the transmission of cancer. If I had a cancer cell on my hand and we shook hands, would I give you cancer? Um, that idea kind of fell beside the wayside, but the recent disease in the Tasmanian devil a little animal that's extremely, extremely inbred uh, and transmits a horrible tumour by biting. If it's not getting enough food, these animals, uh, which are, have enormously strong jaws and crunch um, uh, their prey or, their, or the, uh, uh, what they scavenge, um, bite each other and they transmit this tumour. And they're so inbred, we believe, that uh, there's no graft rejection. Otherwise, of course, we have the phenomenon of allograft rejection, which would normally reject a cancer cell. Um, Immunus itself comes from uh, the Roman state, where Roman soldiers who'd returned from the wars uh, were immune for a time from taxation, the kind of world that's envisaged by people like Tres President Trump for rich people. And um, they, uh, they, they enjoyed that status for a time, though not, I think, forever. And all immunity that we're interested in is mediated by white blood cells or their products. And of course, we have the uh, innate immune system, which is a kind of immediate response system. We're not talking about that so much in this context. Though as we talk more about cancer vaccines, we'll probably be discussing more what the infectious disease people are discussing. That is using molecules from the innate responses as adjuvants to improve immunity. And that's being explored in various ways. There are no such products, I think, on the mo market at the moment, but we may see next generation vaccines that will use elements from the innate response to promote better immune responses. Um, all immunity, what we are interested in here is the adaptive immune response. That's the highly specific immune response, which evolved about 350 million years ago. We think we see the first indications of that in the jawed fish, though the work of Max Cooper recently has taken it somewhat back into the lampreys. Um, we can vaccinate fish, for instance, against fish diseases, and we do. Um, it's not that easy to vaccinate a fish, but it is done. And uh, some of the salmon farming, for instance, and trout farming, they can, they can actually do that. Um, the, uh, but we can't, of course, vaccinate uh, abalone or prawns or, sh or any of those things because they don't have an adaptive immune system as we understand it. It could be that in other life forms there are other types of adaptive systems, but we haven't identified them. And if you think of uh, research dollars, there's very little money around to, uh, to study comparative immunology. Now, all, all adaptive immune responses work in the end analysis uh, by protein-protein interactions or protein-carbohydrate interactions. The proteins we're most familiar with, of course, are the antibody proteins uh, secreted by the B lymphocyte lineage, differentiates to form the large proteins secreting plasma cells, pump out antibodies. These things and the, the uh, memory B cells that emerge from these immune responses, these things can hang around in the body for up to 50 years. We know that from uh, yellow fever vaccine. Um, People who received yellow fever vaccine way back, uh, and we don't in encounter yellow fever or anything that's even close to it that would give us a cross boost. People that encountered yellow fever vaccine 50 years back can still have memory B cells for, for yellow fever and can still have antibodies circulating in the blood. So these are very long lived. I mean, there are antibodies, of course, that will bind carbohydrates, and we're very interested in them in pediatric diseases, particularly some of the bacterial diseases. Um, antibodies in the main, and it's not an absolute statement, in the main, they bind tertiary formed structures on proteins. They bind to conformational determinants. They can bind linear determinants, but most of them are recognizing conformationally determined uh, uh, elements. And of course, their role in infection is to bind directly to the virus that's circulating in the blood, so to stop it getting into tissues and causing damage.
Poliovirus, as we know, uh, replicates in the upper, upper alimentary tract. We don't even notice that's happening. Gets into the blood. If there's antibody there, they've been vaccinated against polio, it gets knocked off straight away. It either gets neutralized or it gets opsonized to be taken out by some other mechanism. It doesn't then get into the brain as it will in a percentage of people uh, and infect large motor nerve cells and cause paralysis. Uh, similar pathogenesis for measles, both very good vaccines. Um, we have problems with some vaccines um, uh, because they uh, uh, of the variability of the pathogen. In influenza is one, and of course HIV. We've never succeeded in making a successful HIV vaccine, and because the virus integrates into the genome, it's quite likely that we actually won't, because both these viruses have extremely poor proofreading mechanisms. They throw off variants all the time, and they escape. So uh, all immune responses, all adaptive immune responses, basically follow the same rules. We have a very small number of precursor cells, whether they be precursor B cells with an antibody type molecule on their surface that will then differentiate into the plasma cell or the killer T cells, which recognize uh, cell surface molecules and are there to actually eliminate or interact with in, uh, various types of cells. Uh, they divide into two categories, the killer cells and the helper cells. The killer cells are just what what we said, they're, they're assassins, they're there to bump off uh, modified cells, and they're the ones we're particularly interested in with cancer immunotherapy. Uh, the helper cells promote the immune response, they, they cause cast switching in the B cell response, they're acting with ep uh, um, structures presented on the dendritic cells, the, the important antigen presenting cell in the lymphoid tissue, and uh, they will, uh, they, they both drive differentiation, they drive the B cell differentiation towards class switching of antibody, and they drive the T cell uh, to become memory cells. Without CD4 helper T cells, distinct, as distinct from the CD8 killer T cell, we don't get good immunological memory. And uh, that took a while to establish, but it, it's pretty much true. We can get good acute responses, but not good memory. So all uh, immune responses follow the same rules. They occur in the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes swell up. We feel rotten. We've got a sore throat, a sore neck. If we've got a respiratory infection, uh, the, we get uh, multiple replications. They can divide every six hours or so, so you can get an enormous expansion very quickly, which can cause a lot of exp uh, confusion, actually, in some experimental protocols. They differentiate over, eight, over about seven or eight days for the killer T cells to become the killer effector cells, the ones that go out and bump off other cells and also bring the response to an end by bumping off the cells that are produce, presenting the, the stimulus, the antigen for the uh, T cell response. And then many of them will die off if we eliminate, say, a virus, and they will go on to be the memory cells. The memory cells are different. They've got different epigenetic profiles. This has been coming out recently with the advances in epigenetics. And uh, people like Steve Turner at Monash, who we, we, was my postdoc years back, have been gradually running down what is the molecular definition of the naive cell, the one that we start with, the effector cell, the one that's the killer, and the memory cell uh, that we can re-stimulate. Um, and it's very interesting, there's a lot of similarities between B cell and T cell memory cells as far as their epigenetic profiles are concerned. The, the character of immunological memory, and that's what we're interested in bringing forth, of course, with the immunotherapy that wakes up the T cell. Characteristic of immunological memory is is that we've got more cells that we can respond, and they can also respond more quickly. And so it's an enhanced response. It's never an immediate response, which is why when we've tried to devise cancer vaccines, say for HIV, that depend on the T cell response, they don't work because the virus gets in, it escapes before that killer T cell response turns on. Uh, the killer T cell response can control HIV infection quite well for a while, but it can't control it in the long term. So, I'm taking too much time over this thing. So, as you all know, monoclonal antibodies have been an enormous advance. Uh, this, this has found great application in therapy and develop, was developed, of course, by Kurler and Milstein, discovery made in Cambridge. Many people were trying to do this. Uh, my uh, former boss, Hilary Koprowski, was trying to immortalize EBV uh, uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines. That didn't work. Uh, and Kurler and Milstein worked out uh, how to do this. Uh, 
Dick Cotton, the Australian, uh, was in the lab just before that, actually, and he just missed and did a lot of the uh, important preliminary work. But they got the Nobel Prize for this. They approached the Medical Research Council in Britain and said, should we patent it? And, they, and the MRC said, oh, no, don't bother about that. It's of no value. And, uh, of course, that was a very <laughs> foolish thing. Uh, but uh, that's why Britain is such a powerhouse. And... Um, <laughs> I can give you a lot of other reasons. I love, I love the Brits, but, um, well, you know, we, Australians have a bit of pathology, uh, as New Zealanders do towards us. And um, so um, the monoclonal antibodies, of course, have been enormously useful in some forms of immunotherapy, especially for lymphoblastoid-type tumours, and, uh, and then combined with other things, and, of course, they're the basis of our immunotherapy strategies. Uh, problems with them, of course, is they're, they're, they're um, very expensive to make. You've got to make them under GMP, good manufacturing practice conditions, and, uh, and they're very expensive to get around. I mean, they're living products. Um, they're not nearly as expensive, though, as the amount that's charged for them. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not up on this, but you guys would know all this stuff a lot better than I do. They're given ridiculous names that also annoy the people who make them, uh, because you can never look at what the name is and actually get back to what the actual product is without sort of doing some research and looking up and trying to find out what the hell does this thing target. I mean, ipilumumab. I mean, what the hell? I mean, really? Uh, why do they do this? Well, you know, that's marketing and that's a different world. Um, so this is basically with the situation with infection. The antibodies work well against systemic infections. All our vaccines that are successful are largely based on antibody responses. They, uh, they work polio, measles, systemic infections, viruses that don't change much. Uh, they work well there. There's a challenge, of course, with, uh, say, flu, which changes all the time, and we have to keep making new, um, new uh, vaccines every year. Same thing with HIV. Uh, HIV and flu research, as far as vaccination, or immunotherapy goes, is focusing a lot on, uh, on trying to target shared epitopes that are common. Uh, these could, for instance, could be the stalk epitopes on a protein, where you've got a variable head, as you do both in flu and HIV. Uh, problem is, though, that they're hard to make these antibodies, hard to get a vaccine to make them. They're made occasionally in immune responses, and you can isolate the monoclonals, and that may have some application, but, uh, but it's a really difficult strategy. And there's also a little bit of concern that some of these antibodies could promote autoimmunity. And of course, it's going to be uh, no way that we're going to start injecting with people with things that uh, could cause autoimmunity. But that's the way a lot of that vaccine research is going. Uh, we do have two immunoglobulin-based antivirus cancer vaccines. The first is the Hep B vaccine, uh, developed uh, I think by many people, uh, we've got a strong group at our institute that works at, on Hep B and has for years. Uh, and of course, by by removing that inflammatory response in the liver, that chronic inflammatory response, which drives cell division and as a consequence drives mutation and drives oncogenesis, uh, you, you effectively make an anti-cancer vaccine. It's not targeted against the cancer, it's targeted against the virus, works perfectly well. And then of course, there's the human papillomavirus vaccine, a great triumphant story, uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful advance. I didn't think it would work actually, but Ian Fraser pushed on with it and, uh, and basically prevents infection with the human papillomavirus. And of course, it's an oncogenic virus. It is uh, formerly an oncogenic virus. And uh, of course, uh, there's been a Nobel Prize for that, for the uh, virus oncogenesis. Um, there's a an important difference if you think of immune selection of mutant viruses and mutant cancer cells. And I, I just pointed out to you because you might not have thought about it. Uh, viruses survive in nature as a consequence of their capacity to transmit. They have to be able to transmit. And especially when you've got a large complex virus like EBV or the Carposis virus, then like the herpes viruses in general, uh, if, you, if they mutate, you're likely to compromise some part of their really complex uh, strategy, which involves uh, latency and all the rest of it. So you don't find those big DNA viruses mutating. Uh, it's the small RNA viruses without proofreading mechanisms that mutate a lot. Because any mutational changes are likely to involve a fitness cost. So they have other survival strategies, but it's, it's not always mutation. The cancer cell is not under that constraint. So long as it can proliferate away and it can multiply away 
after mutational change that removes the immune control, uh, you will get, uh, you, the cancer will advance. But of course, it's also, apart from being a smart parasite, it's the ultimate dumb parasite, because when it kills its organism, its host, it kills itself. Uh, I, I play with the idea it's a modern for, model for modern capitalism, but uh, that, that's a bit lefty, isn't it, really? And, uh, but it, it, it is, uh, is the case. So here we see a killer T cell at work. Killer T cell is the green cell. It's coming down. It's going to bump off that cell, which is modified by a peptide, and bang, there she goes. So that's pretty dead. So the killer T cell is really a suicide-inducing cell because it triggers the apoptotic pathway in the tumor cell or whatever it may be, the virus-infected cell, causes it to destroy itself. And uh, with viruses, of course, that's enormous. With cancer, obviously, that's important. It's about cells. We have to destroy cells. With viruses, it's enormously important because viruses only multiply within living cells, and we have to destroy those virus-producing cellular factories, and that's what they do. Uh, these are videos by Misty Jenkins, a former PhD student of ours, worked in Cambridge, a Curie scholar, um, then was at Peter Mac with Joe Papani, now has her own lab at the Hall Institute. And, of course, what we know from more recent recent research is that T-cell receptor uh, recognizes uh, the, the transplantation molecules on the surface of cells. That's how it's targeted the cell surface. And that's what we got the Nobel Prize for, is in showing that these killer T-cells are targeted through to the cell surface by the need to recognize some modification of self-transplantation molecules. We call it all the self. The peptide bit was discovered 10 years later by Alan Townsend, working in the UK, who might, might well have shared the Nobel Prize with me and with Rolf Sinkenagel. Um, this is our, uh, I was asked to say, Andrew asked me to say something about the history of it. This is our early sketches. You've got to realize this is 45 years ago. We're not only working before uh, PCR, we're working before monoclonal antibodies, we're working before recombinant DNA technology, we're rec working before we were able to synthesize large amounts of protein on cell surface because we didn't have recombinant DNA technology to produce it. Uh, this was, discovery was made in 1973, 74. Uh, it was worked out by mouse genetics, basically. Uh, I won't go into the details because I don't have time, but it's a classical case how all science builds on something else. The transplantation geneticists had, de had, had defined the mouse transplantation system very, very beautifully by recombinant uh, strategies, classical mouse breeding experiments, and uh, brother system mating and all the rest of it. No, we had this great definition of the transplantation response. We knew that it was very powerful. No one knew what the transplantation system was for. We actually discovered why we have a transplantation system. It's not a, it's not a foreign rejection system. It's a system for monitoring the integrity of our own body cells that are modified by binding a peptide from a pathogen or an oncofetal protein or something of that sort. So these are our crude uh, 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 diagrams at the beginning. We're, we got the Nobel Prize really for, uh, I think, for three or four articles, two-sided articles published in Nature as letters. It was great publishing in Nature then. They, you couldn't do a lot of the experiments, so you, you weren't asked to, you had to, had to do them. Now it's almost impossible because you can do all the experiments. I much more enjoyed that earlier time when you couldn't do the experiments. It was more fun. You could speculate a lot more. Now we know, of course, that the T cell receptor recognizes peptide bound into the tip of the transplant molecule. You can, and this is from a co-crystallization of T cell receptor and peptide MHC complex. And you can see, uh, see how that works. Uh, one of our papers done with Jamie Rossjohn at, at Monash, Structural Biology Lab. And, um, and the reason we were able to work it out was because of the work on transplantation that had been done at the Jackson Laboratories in Bar Harbor, Maine, with mice by George Snell. If we'd been stuck with trying to work it out just in humans with the definition of HLA, which was defined serologically, it would have taken decades and we, we, because it was a total morass. And so if anyone says to you that mouse experiments aren't important, they're, they're, not, they're, they're talking through some other orifice. And, uh, it, uh, it has been enormously important, as you all know in cancer research in the way that the immunotherapy molecules developed. Uh, we got the Nobel Prize in 1996, so that's 22 years after the discovery, the first publications. That's a pretty normal uh, kind of uh, um, um, uh, interval, actually, to get a Nobel Prize now. They don't like to get it wrong. And uh, that's the lineup of scoundrels on the stage there. And, uh, and after the Nobel Prize, you don't get any more prizes. You get your picture painted. Um, 
I, I was on a stamp, which in Australia is uh, it's better to be in Australia for that, because in America, I think you have to be dead. And um, uh, the, uh, the one on the left is a sort of a chocolate box image uh, that's at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, where I worked for decades. Uh, it's run by the American Lebanese Syrian Associated Charities, and it actually makes me look Lebanese. And, uh, which is hard for us, Anglo-Irish. And, and the other one is by Rico Amor, the Australian uh, painter, who normally paints decrepit industrial landscapes, and he painted me as a decrepit industrial landscape, and that's in the National Portrait Gallery. And you get honorary degrees. Uh, this one shows uh, that uh, if it's not true that all men are fools, all men can be made to look like fools. Um, and uh, this is an honorary degree we got in, uh, in Europe where they dressed us up like medieval monks. And uh, you can see why there's never been an Irish Pope. The ears are too big and for those funny little hats. You need one of those square faces, you know, that's emphatic. And, uh, and also it shows you the men have no idea what to do with flowers because they gave us flowers. And, you know, Asians do that. They give you flowers, you sniff them, you hand them on to the hand off lady and uh, th this was European they didn't do that so we got stuck with these flowers and as some of my female friends have pointed out we're holding them in front of our crotch which is something to do with the male condition so uh, and uh, the latest uh, great honor I've had is having a street named after me in Brisbane my hometown the buildings in the background are Bogger Road Jail <laughs> and um, so this is the CD8 killer T-cell response. Uh, clone, I'm going over clonal expansion, uh, replication, and all the rest of it. And uh, I've gone on too long. Um, what we're doing with immunotherapy is we're waking up those T-cells that are sitting in the tissues. And as we know, this is uh, from Scott Mueller, who's now at the WEHI, uh, now at our institute. And what we're doing is we're turning these T-cells back on by, by targeting these molecules. And you know that story, and you, this is the story you're now going to hear from other people. So I don't really need to go on with it anyway. And of course, the other advances, we've got these CAR T-cells, where we're engineering immunoglobulin-like molecules into the T-cell and targeting that way. The problem here is, of course, that these T cells are not, um, are not going into tumours in the way we would like. And there's a whole lot of stuff we need to do, but I think we'll see with the immune, comp uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, I think we'll see a combination of those in use with cancer vaccines. And, uh, and then we need to know more about the biology of what gets T cells into tumours. So there I'm finishing, and you can go and we will now hear from some people who are actually working on cancer, and, uh, and we'll tell you their stories. So, so I think you'll all agree that was an absolutely outstanding presentation. Thank you, Peter. And we just have a, a small gift that we'd like to give to you. That was a fascinating uh, lecture by our Nobel laureate, which is uh, quite succinctly, he pre presented various aspects of immunology so nicely. I okay, thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the final speaker in the immunotherapy session, uh, Professor Rod Hicks, who is uh, very well known to, I'm sure, virtually everybody in this audience. Uh, he has a stellar track record in the development of molecular imaging uh, in a range of different uh, clinical indications, but over the last uh, 10 to 15 years in particular in cancer, and he leads uh, the cancer imaging uh, department and, and a very large research group at the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute, um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rod to give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's really a great pleasure to uh, present to you. I, I'm, I'm, I guess, a light relief. Uh, if your brain is exploding like mine is, uh, with all the high science that Peter and, and Shireen has, has done, uh, presented to you, I'm going to present you mainly opinion, uh, because unfortunately, in this area, what, the, what is the role of molecular imaging in monitoring immunotherapy is largely an evidence-free zone at this stage. Uh, when Andrew asked me for the title of this talk, uh, on, on Friday, uh, it was titled TBC, to be confirmed, and I thought that's
that's actually quite a good title to go with uh, because the role, I think, is still to be confirmed in terms of uh, how we use molecular imaging in this new and evolving field. This is the decaying temple of therapeutic oncology. Uh, perhaps it's ancient rather than maybe decaying. Uh, we've had surgery for thousands of years. Uh, we've had uh, radiotherapy for over 100 years. Uh, radionuclide therapy actually was not far behind uh, uh, radiotherapy with external uh, x-rays. Uh, chemotherapy came much later. And then uh, in, in my medical practice, uh, we've been involved in, in targeted therapies, a, a new innovation in the last 10 years. The new kit on the block is obviously immunotherapy. What is the role of PET-CT in, in the immunotherapy era? Well, firstly, we need to identify the patients who will potentially benefit, and that's about disease localization, and that's something the PET does really well. Uh, and the, the other pediment is characterization, which we've generally we've left to the pathologist, but increasingly molecular imaging can also characterize disease. Let's talk about immunotherapy. Shireen very nicely introduced the, the agents that we mainly use, the uh, uh, anti-CTLA-4 and the anti-PD-1, and uh, Peter mentioned uh, CAR T cells, the, the uh, chimeric antigen receptor uh, modified cells. Immunotherapy is a malignant growth. Uh, if you look at the number of keynote uh, trials, the pembrolizumab and checkmate trials, they're, they're, they're now getting into the hundreds. Uh, the problem with these therapies uh, in, in malignancy, the targeted therapies have very high response rates, but they're not very durable. The patients develop resistance rel relatively quickly. Immunotherapy, on the other hand, has rather low uh, response rates uh, in terms of complete response, but there is that tail on them, so they're durable. And so increasingly, people are thinking, of combining these to get the high response rates from the targeted therapies to increase, particularly neoantigenic presentation, and combining that with immunotherapies to try and get more durable responses. And so we're going to see a large number of these combination uh, trials. And what we're looking at in molecular imaging, or we're going to have to look at, is, is what is uh, the, the combination uh, pattern of response. If we look at the, the combination of anti-CTLA-4 uh, an anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, uh, the IPI-NEVO uh, combination, we see that we get pretty high response rates, as, um, uh, as Shireen pointed out, in these patients, a 53% objective response rate. Uh, however, complete responses are rather rare, particularly the single agents. Uh, we're seeing 5% uh, with IPI uh, in this particular trial and around 20% with the combination uh, However, overall response rates are getting up to around 50 to 60 per cent uh, with these, these um, uh, agents. Uh, you won't be able to read this, but I'll, I'll summarise it because there is a cost to this, and uh, Shireen said that these are tolerable. Uh, it's often said that uh, uh, medical oncologists can tolerate almost all of their patients' symptoms with great uh, impunity, uh, but patients do suffer, unfortunately, side effects. So any treatment-related uh, grade three or four adverse event uh, ranges from around 20% with single-agent uh, immunotherapy to up to 60% in, when they're used in combination. Uh, one of the more common ones and the more disabling for patients and also a rather expensive one in some cases to manage is the development of colitis, which occurs in about 8% and seems to be much more common with the anti-CTLA agents. Uh, and pneumonitis is also, as Shireen pointed out, a rare but rather serious uh, complication of this disease. Not only are we using it in patients who we know have metastatic disease, we're using it in patients who uh, we assume uh, have metastatic disease, the so-called adjuvant use uh, in patients who've had resection of uh, particularly lymph node disease uh, or oligometastatic disease. And you can see that with either uh, the PD-L1 uh, agent uh, or uh, uh, ipilimumab, the anti-CTLA-4, uh, that there are uh, patients who are you know, having long-term survival. We have to remember in Kaplan's survive, Meyer survival curves, however, that anyone who's above that line is dead. And so these agents are still not curing even patients with microscopic disease, and so we clearly need to do better. Uh, and it does come at a cost, as I, I said, that there's significant toxicity. So uh, as Shireen has uh, very nicely uh, pointed out, 
increasingly we have tools available to us uh, to understand the biological uh, nature of malignancy. And we need to be able to apply that to biological characterization of an individual patient uh, with the idea of developing targeted therapeutics, both to the, the tumour itself and to the immune environment, with the idea of rational and efficient treatments being developed for these patients. And so uh, I think we need to move beyond, in molecular imaging, looking at sensitivity and specificity to looking at the characterization of the disease. So we need to clinically move from what I call lumpology to characterization of biology. In terms of this biology, we have, uh, uh, with immunotherapy, these two particular uh, arms, the uh, effector arm, the anti-CTLA, which expands and activates T cells to go and fight the, the tumour, in a sense, uh, and the PD-1, PD-L1 blockade, which is about the cells being killed by the, uh, the T cells. So if we uh, think about this in simplistic terms, and I'm rather simplistic in the way I, I, I like to use analogy, the, uh, the tumours are like the Roman soldiers. I, I like that Peter showed Roman soldiers in, in his talk because they're going to appear in my talk. The invaders are the Roman soldiers. Uh, the, the defenders, the immune system, are Asterix and Obelix and all his friendly uh, uh, team. Uh, and... Uh, some of, some of the people on the team are good guys and some of them are bad guys. Uh, the, the CD8 and the myeloid derived suppressor cells are telling, don't fight, don't, don't put up a fight, but Asterix wants to, to be armed and kill the uh, Roman soldier. And that's where anti-CTLA-4 comes in. Uh, it's uh, activating uh, Asterix to go out and kill uh, the Roman soldier. In that battlefield, uh, lymphocytes are gonna come in to the cancer cell and they're going to be very active. Uh, and this led to the concept of pseudoprogression, where you have these tumours that become more exophytic, more uh, inflamed before they die. Uh, and so uh, th this is first described, and appropriately so, with the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies uh, because they're priming the T cells in the lymph, the lymph nodes to come into the tumour to start to, to kill uh, the tumour cells. Uh, and this is uh, defined as a progression uh, followed by response without any change in the treatment. And it's led to, with, within the radiology field, what's called the immune-related resist uh, response, re response criteria. Uh, and this was validated at a pathological level when they cut out some of these lesions which appeared to have progressed and found it had a dense infiltrate. The tumour infiltrating lymphocytes uh, numbers were significantly increased and the tumours were largely necrotic uh, with uh, very few, if any, uh, viable tumour cells. And so the immune-related uh, uh, response criteria uh, has really four patterns. Uh, shrinkage, obviously, is a good thing. Uh, durable, stable disease, which in some patients followed by slow, steady decline. A response after initial increase in total tumour burden and the response in other lesions in the presence of new lesions, and I'll show, show you examples of that. And this enables a better stratification of patients, but it's based on morphologic criteria, of course, uh, rather than uh, molecular imaging. And I don't expect you to read this, but this, if there's ever been a committee uh, in, in guidelines, this is, this is it. You can, it. It's an incredibly uh, complex thing to, to you know, resist is bad enough, the rarely enlightening, commonly inaccurate surveillance technique, uh, but uh, uh, I resist is even worse, the idiotic resist uh, criteria, I'd call it. Uh, in terms of uh, distinct immune checkpoints, as I pointed out, one arm is the uh, initiator uh, uh, and the other one is the effector, limbs, if you like, of the adaptive immune response. Any time that you activate a cell and it's doing work, it's going to use more energy. And so you're going to see increased FDG uptake uh, in, in the tumours where that's uh, having a role. Uh, whereas if you're killing cells and the, the, you're decreasing the, the total uh, uh, tumour burden, you'll get decrease. So, where do we get the balance between those, between uh, an increased FDG signal and a decrease in FDG signal? Something that we normally use when we're using FDG in therapeutic response assessment, we like to see a decrease as an indicator of the efficacy of treatment. So, 
pattern recognition rules. Here's a patient who, that little red arrow, which you probably can't see, there's a lung lesion there, a small lung lesion in this patient. What we also see is very profound uptake in the draining lymph nodes of that in a pattern that anyone who grew up in the era of gallium scanning would recognise as a lambda sign uh, of granulomatous disease sarcoidosis. With the initiation of treatment with ipilimumab in this patient, we see what we would otherwise consider progression of disease. Increased uptake in supraclavicular nodes, uh, other nodes in the epigastrium, nodes in lots of other places. But we suspected that this was all uh, an immune flare response, that we were seeing uh, the, the draining lymph nodes from those sites being activated. And indeed, with time, that all went away, as did the lung nodule, which was the only site of uh, obvious disease that we could see on either imaging uh, with CT or with PET. Uh, but clearly, uh, the activation of lymph nodes in other drainage basins suggests that it was also likely to be micrometastatic disease elsewhere in this particular patient. The other thing that you see here is the increase in splenic uptake, the site of production of, of T cells and the residence of T cells being activated uh, sequentially in this uh, immune response. Pseudo progression, this adaptive immune response, is not only seen with immunotherapy, it's also seen with targeted therapies. Uh, one of the first targeted therapies in melanoma was the use of. Uh, of uh, agents that block signaling through the MAP kinase pathway that Shireen pointed out is also important in the immune system. Here's a patient who started on a combined BRAF and MEK inhibitor to block the two sequential uh, gene products in the MAP kinase pathway. And you can see that uh, uh, arrow pointing to a, a lung metastasis that within days of starting the targeted therapy, it's turned off metabolism. Uh, in that cell, uh, but uh, a month later, we're starting to see that same immune response in the draining lymph nodes that uh, uh, we saw in, in the previous example with ipilimumab, uh, and by 180 days, it's gone away. And so here is that the lung lesion. The lung lesion hasn't died, hasn't been removed yet. It's stopped growing. Uh, it stopped metabolizing glucose. It then starts to die through, through starvation of glycolytic uh, uh, products and you get the activation of the draining lymph nodes as antigens are presented to the draining lymph nodes in, in this setting and eventually the, the tumour goes away. So the timing is very important. In the same way that the immune-related resist response uh, can uh, accept the presence of new uh, nodes in the present or new sites of disease in the presence of uh, regression in others, we see the same thing occurring in uh, uh, molecular imaging response. So here's a patient developing new uh, lymph nodes in both axillae at the same time that a lesion in, in skeletal muscle, not really well seen on CT, is regressing uh, in this particular patient. Uh, we see the complication of immune-related uh, 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 autoimmunity with the development of synovitis in this patient and the complete regression of a, of a liver lesion. And so the pattern becomes very important to recognise this. Another example here, here's a, uh, a liver lesion which is clearly regressing uh, as the, the T lymphocytes come in and, and kill that uh, uh, site but we see activation of a draining lymph node in the, the porta hepatis, the, the drainage pattern of this uh, lesion. So these new nodes, new sites, are not progressive disease. They're actually uh, activation of the immune system. Similarly here, a patient with bony metastasis and, and lymph node metastasis and pleural metastases, the pattern of disease changes with treatment an increase in mediastinal nodes, but re response in the other sites of disease. A subtle increase in spleen, again, the activation of the uh, immune system, uh, and a very favourable response. And when we look at this patient after six cycles of PD-1 inhibitor, complete uh, morphologic and metabolic response in, in this tumour. So we're starting to think about potentially integrating
what we're seeing on a structural level and what's happening uh, at a molecular level. And this is a paper from Steve Cho uh, uh, at um, uh, John Hopkins uh, showing that a subgroup of patients who have what appears to be an immunological flare, an increase in, in the activity in their tumours, but regression of the tumour on morphologic criteria ended up being uh, predictive of benefit. And so I suspect we'll see, I persist, uh, Rich Wall, I think it's probably in the audience, uh, the persist criteria well known to most people in this audience. Uh, we're likely to see a similar thing uh, perhaps coming for I, I persist uh, with uh, patients who have a morphologic response clearly likely to benefit from these therapies. Uh, in the group of patients with progressive disease, most of them are going to do worse if their tumours are clearly growing, uh, whereas in uh, patients with stable disease, uh, a flare might uh, end up being able to stratify these patients. The problem with that particular trial is almost all the patients were on ipilimumab and very few on the combination, and so I think we're still uh, the jury's still out on, on how we're going to interpret the combination studies. But So just to summarise, the patterns of pseudoprogression on an FDG is reactive nodal uptake in drainage basins of metastases. Uh, for mediastinal hyalinodes, the symmetry is important, the, the lambda sign, uh, that reactive splenic uptake is a very important indicator that there's probably been activation of the immune system. And you can also see that in, uh, in the tonsils, in, in Waldau's ring, and in, in para-appendiceal uh, uh, lymphoid uptake. Uh, sorry, uh, Shireen also pointed out very nicely the uh, importance of mutational burden and the diseases that, that have high mutational burden also tend to have a rather high PD-L1 expression and tend to uh, suppress the immune system. So drugs that block the uh, PD-1 uh, have, again, uh, the analogy of the invaders and the defenders, but in this case, the, the invaders put up their shields on the outside. They have the tortoise um, uh, 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 formation, famous for the, uh, the centurions, Roman centurions, and Obelix has his, uh, uh, his, his men air that he can throw on and break down the, uh, the shields and, and kill the soldier. And uh, this is one of the patients that you saw, a very famous Australian, uh, who uh, uh, was one of the first patients, I think the first patient treated uh, with PD PD-1 inhibitor and had a very dramatic response. These images are incredibly powerful to convince regulators and, and patients that this is an effective therapy. Uh, with PD-1, because we're looking at the killing of cells, decreased FDG, most of the rules that we've applied for other cytotoxic therapies, chemotherapy, radiation, that a reduction in FDG is a good thing. It's just that the kinetics are very different. They tend to be much slower in uh, their response than we tend to see with, with radiotherapy or chemotherapy, often over months uh, occurring. But sometimes with small lesions, they can disappear very quickly. And so this is a patient uh, with small volume lung metastases, you can see on the baseline study, Within 14 days, the lymphocytes have gone in and killed off the cells, and there was morphologic response. And you see, if we look a bit later, we start to again see the immune uh, response, the development of lymphocytes uh, in, in draining lymph nodes. And by 20, uh, 120 days, they've moved off, they've, they've done their work, presumably become memory cells in the tissue somewhere, uh, but no longer being actively uh, um, proliferating in the, uh, the lymph nodes. And so the temporal profile is something, again, that we're going to have to define as a group. When is the optimal time to assess response with molecular imaging in these patients? One of the, the things that we found PET most useful for, uh, even though we're not entirely sure when we're looking at the response, uh, what's what, is that we can see the uh, adverse reactions, colitis, endocrine, toxicities, hepatitis, pneumonitis, pancreatitis, nephritis, because most of those inflammatory processes also use deoxyglucose. Uh, the, the time frame of these occurs highly variably. Uh, they can occur out to months after the onset of treatment. And so when we look, uh, we'll depend what we see to some extent. Uh, here's a, a series of patients, uh, or of 
patient studies uh, in, a, in a patient who had a uh, uh, in transit nodule on the thigh, you can see that uh, you know very nice response uh, in that lesion, uh, but the patient had developed intense uptake in in the colon. Uh, we asked the patient, "Do you have any diarrhoea?" They said, "No." Uh, uh, and, but we rang up the, the medical oncologist and said, we think this patient has colitis. And uh, they said, well, the patient's got no symptoms. They sent him home. Next day, she came in with fulminant uh, diarrhoea uh, and ended up on steroids uh, and eventually infleximab as well to control uh, severe colitis. We don't, not only see inflammation in the large bowel, we can see it in the small bowel and stomach. This is a gastroenteritis with high uptake in the stomach and small bowel. Uh, in this patient, they ended up losing a lot of weight without any particular diarrhoea, but be presumably because of malabsorption, it was a sort of celiac-like uh, 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 disease. Uh, we can see uh, uh, the activation of glands, like in this case, the thyroid gland, very common, usually tested for routinely by uh, people administering uh, immunotherapy, uh, looking for evidence of hyper or hypothyroidism. But in this case, we also see sarcoid-like activation, the spleen and the bone marrow, as well as mediastinal lymph nodes coming up during therapy. Uh, the pituitary gland can also be affected, and again, if you don't look, you won't see, and I'd encourage you all, when you're looking at immunotherapy patients, to go through the brain very carefully and, and look in the pituitary fossa. You'll find it quite commonly uh, there. Uh, you'll see some uh, inflammation uh, in the, uh, the pituitary fossa you can see here. We also see adrenal, uh, uh, adrenalitis. This is a patient clearly had a, a beautiful response um, in the tumour, but coming up uh, progressively over time, increased uptake in the adrenal glands uh, reflecting uh, adrenalitis in this particular patient. We can also see the, the standard um, range of immunologic uh, complications that rheumatologists uh, are very used to. Uh, the, uh, in this case, the, the shrinkage of the tumour is the clear evidence that this, this uh, treatment is working. Uh, but as well as that, uh, we're getting uh, an increase in the um, interspinous bursitis, so Bastrop's disease, synovitis in, 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 uh, in draining uh, in the um, synovial capsule of, um, uh, of large joints, and an enthesopathy in this case. We also see vasculitis, I don't know how well that you can uh, uh, appreciate that on, the, on this particular slide, but this patient also had, um, you can see the increase uptake in the fascia. This is a fasciitis, and uh, uh, if we look here at the uh, aorta, no uptake in the aorta, and progressively in the, in the wall of the aorta, uh, and eventually settling down with uh, the use of steroids. We see pancreatitis, we see pneumonitis, and a range of other diseases. Uh, in our own series, and, and this is an expanding uh, group that we've looked at, we're seeing immune-related side effects in around 20% of patients identified on PET but not previously recognised clinically. So it's important that you look for those. Um, uh, in, in these cases, um, we still are uncertain exactly how to interpret uh, the, the scans on, on, the, on the whole. So he, here's a patient that I showed you before with that um, gastroenteritis, gastric uptake and small bowel, uh, but we're seeing a marked reduction in cerebral glucose metabolism. We don't know why. Why is that, why is that occurring? Uh, here's a patient who had that same uh, uh, phenotype of reduced cerebral glucose metabolism developed ascites, gross uh, loss of weight, uh, but at the same time, their tumours were responding on the whole, getting uh, a lower uh, metabolic uh, burden. And here's a lesion who didn't that didn't respond, but was progressing on CT, becoming increasingly lytic. So how do we integrate this in our uh, message back to the oncologist? Is this treatment working? Uh, the patient's losing weight, they're developing ascites, some of their tumours getting less, some are progressing. I think we, we still have a lot to learn uh, in how to use it. Maybe we need to move away from the, the lack of specificity of FDG and maybe look at the target 
of the therapies themselves. And uh, in the future, I'm sure we're going to have new agents that can look at PDL1, at uh, PD1, uh, um, and, and uh, image them. These are uh, preclinical images, obviously, but these are starting to enter into uh, to clinical practice. Uh, there are also, as well as um, radio-labelled versions of the therapeutic antibodies, there are also um, constructs of those like Ednexin, developed by the BMS group and recently published by David Donnelly and co-workers. As well as that, if we want to look at the immune infiltrate, the activated T cells, uh, the work of Sam Gambier's group um, with um, uh, the ARAG, which is taken up specifically in uh, activated T lymphocytes, may be helpful to look at that initiator limb as well as the effector limb and making the selection of who needs IPI, uh, who needs the PD1, PDL1. Uh, inhibitor may be something that we can do prospectively and look at its modulation during time, over time uh, during therapy. So in summary, the, the great advantage of FDG is our ability to assess global response, a whole body uh, response. Uh, in this case, you can see a patient who had uh, local radiotherapy to a, a, a pelvic lesion but developed nodal progression. And when the patient was given ipinevo, uh, you can see that uh, profound immune response uh, in the draining lymph nodes. Plus, in this case, the patient had um, uh, sarcoid um, nerve root uh, inf inflammatory change uh, in this particular case. Uh, and you can see that the nodes have gone away, so the pattern becomes incredibly important in doing that. The other thing in this patient, you see the increase in muscular uptake as a manifestation of polymyositis. So the key points are that new immunotherapy drugs are producing major clinical responses, that metabolic changes can precede anatomic changes both in both directions, an increase uh, from pseudo progression and a decrease uh, when you're, you're um, reducing the, the, the viable cell numbers. That immune related inflammatory responses are common uh, in reactive nodes uh, uh, in the next drainage, lymphoid drainage uh, basin to the, where the tumour was, and that splenic uptake is something you should look for as a clue to that uh, phenomenon. Uh, molecular imaging may be uh, key to early response assessment and help to avoid toxicity in non-responders if there's clearly uh, true progression in, in disease. Uh, quality of life uh, and, uh, and, and cost-effectiveness questions, um, these uh, uh, treatments are very expensive. Uh, and if we can stop them being used in patients who, who aren't responding, that, that would be a good thing. We also need to be aware of the side effects of new drugs and the immune-related uh, adverse events uh, can be identified on PET and, and they need to be uh, uh, passed on to the medical oncologist so they can avoid um, uh, the, uh, the treatment. Um, I thought I'd finish because Peter started uh, with, uh, with the, the talk of, of saying how important big science is, the, the interaction between our community, the nuclear medicine community, uh, and scientists and clinicians is incredibly important, the scientific research. And I think, uh, if, I hope I haven't missummarized your, 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 your book, that, that uh, Peter said that science is a team sport and that we need partnerships between clinicians, scientists, universities, industry and government and research investment doesn't always provide immediate or obvious commercial outcomes. As Peter showed, it took him 20 years to get the Nobel Prize and everyone thought that uh, immunotherapy would never have a future. Uh, I think that like Plato, uh, hopefully we've uh, shown you the light, uh, that there is perhaps a role for molecular imaging. We can play an important part in uh, the development of this new and exciting area of medicine. With that, I thank you for your attention. So that was an absolutely outstanding uh, presentation. So I'd just like to uh, thank Rod, and uh, we've got a small gift for him. <laughs>